let's talk about your actual platform. Like, what do you stand for? So you said that some people on the right say, you're a socialist, and people on the left say, you're a conservative. You were a Bernie Sanders voter who voted for Trump. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, don't put it that way. <laughs> well, you know, but a lot of people, a lot of people. And for me, I, I never voted for Trump. But this time, this time, I, you know, I'm, I probably will. <laughs> this will be the one time that, because I just cannot, I just, Really, I think it's more about I'm interested in seeing him blow things up in there. You know, I'm just I, right. I like that he's kind of like a walking time bomb. Nobody knows which way he's going to go. He's uncontrollable completely. And I just like the fear that he instills in the establishment, clearly, because they keep going after him over and over and over again. So I'm like, well, you know, a hey, more of the same or we could choose this Molotov cocktail and see what happens yeah. You know, this time <laughs> around. Um, so tell us about your platform. So what where so you say you don't agree with the libertarian party on economics uh are you a socialist are no you a marxist? I'm, i am not a socialist i am not a marxist i'm not a libertarian i am an american patriot who believes in hamiltonian economics and larouche's methods of economics what is that well this book here earth's next 50 years by lyndon larouche has really outlined for me the policy that you know that it's on my website and that i sent to you the space ccc policy but i think my economic my my overall outlook on how I see government and the role of government is, is this. What is it that we can ensure that we need to do right now? What kind of policy do we need to orient so that the next 50 years of Earth can actually be something prosperous for people? In other words, don't you think it's a moral failure that the Bronx today is just as bad as it was in 1970? Right? It's horrible today. There's been no real economic progress. But when the Wright brothers, okay, made a plane in 1903, 50 years later, you had people working on aeronautic parts that were going to space. And then in 57, you had Sputnik. Then 10 years later, you had a man on the moon. Okay. I believe a man was on the moon. I, maybe we can, I don't know. What, what, <laughs> I, there, we put someone on the moon. Now, <laughs> excuse me. Now, what, <laughs> what I believe, right, is that, we need to, we, we, at some point, not at some point, in the 70s, and actually after Kennedy was assassinated, there was this belief that um, there are too many people on the planet. This is when the overpopulation myth started coming out. There's too many people on the planet, right? So we need to have some kind of degrowth movement. We need to slow down our growth or else the world's going to be overpopulated and there's going to be a ton of poverty and violence. And it's all, right? Because the policy you have right now is an anti-human, anti-development policy, right? Whereas opposed to we have something called the Oasis Plan. This is something that Helga Zepp LaRouche has, has put out at the Schiller Institute. And this idea that you need to, in order to stop the wars in the Middle East, what's needed is an actual development plan. You need to bring water to that region, desalinated water, actual infrastructure, roads, highways. You need to build high-speed rail in that region. You need to get that region developed so that you can build new cities in those regions, right? That's the same idea that existed in Kennedy's mind in 1962 and 63, right? It's like, hmm. What are we how can you actually guarantee the survival of the human species if you're not always thinking ahead? In other words, how can I make sure that not just the Bronx, not just the country, but the world is a better place 50 years after I'm dead? Like mm -hmm. what contribution can I make right now and what kind of policy can I make right now to make sure that the future is always better than it is today? That's my policy outlook. That's my governmental outlook. Is that socialism? Is that libertarianism? I don't think it matters. It's not, it's, you cannot put that in a label. It's just human. That's just what I think a human being should do. And that's what the founding fathers believed in. Governor Morris, who was a founding father, right? People don't know this name. It's a funny name, Governor Morris. He's buried in the South Bronx. Okay, on 140th Street and St. Anne's Avenue, St. Anne's Church, right? He penned the Constitution. He literally wrote out the Constitution, and he is the author of the preamble, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. People quote these words all the time, and they have no idea what it actually means. I'm sorry. I really need to work on that, Kim. I'm so, these people, I'm, <laughs> I, might, I might be in the government. I might, you know, and it's like I, I need to. My point is the founding, <laughs> the founding fathers had a real conception that it is in posterity that you always think 
about because you and I are temporary here. I've only got what 50 years at best left on this planet. So how do I make sure Hopefully that people... longer than that? You're only 25, right? So well, the let, media, what another it, 75 it, years for you. Well, <laughs> I don't want to be like a Nancy Pelosi or a Diane Feinstein. <laughs> Why <just> not? Like... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the founding fathers had this conception that it's in the future. The pos posterity is the only thing that we know is tangible. We know that there will always be a future. So how can we make sure that we are doing something right now for the future? And that's my policy outlook. That's why I, I, I that's, that's who I am. Can okay, you put so that in a box? Let, let, let's break that down a little bit. So you're obviously anti-war. <laughs> yes. I think we got that. We got you can't that. have a future if there's a nuclear, you know, warheads sure. going off. So are you always anti-war? Are you ever for war? Is there any circumstance? Oh, I, 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 uh, I almost did my horrible impression of Kennedy, of, of RFK Jr., uh, because he's, I, I, I'm anti-war when I don't have to be anti-war, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think, um, yes, I, I would say yes, because every single war for the last 60 years has not been justified. I mean, the last justifiable world war was World War II, right? Yeah. That, I think, was probably the last example where it actually was justifiable. Every single war after that has been manipulated and provoked by the US, UK, and NATO right. forces, right? Trying to put their imperialist boot on there. Maybe we should get rid of those forces first. The imperialist forces that have hijacked the, the American government, that have hijacked the Constitution, okay? And get rid of them first and then watch how many wars are actually start, you know, start to disappear around the world, yeah. right? I believe that the BRICS nations and this idea of there being a, a new Silken Road. And this was an idea that that Lynn and Helga LaRouche had developed in the 90s, right? That you can actually have joint economic cooperation between countries that doesn't require fighting, right? right. But just actual real scientific development between countries, you know, building nuclear plants, high speed rail, uh, bringing water to places that don't have that's water. That's actually how you stay out of war is when you partner with yeah. countries and you build each other up. That's how, you know, those partnerships. And that's, you know, it's funny that they don't even think like that because they think they do think that way when it comes to like NATO. That's a partnership. They know it's a partnership and they say this is a partnership that keeps us out of war. Right. Well, yeah. what about all the other partnerships? Make more partnerships, not war. But base it on something else. Don't base it on, oh, it's a defense pact. Base it on, it's a business pact. We're in business together. So we don't want to war with one another because we're mutual. It's mutually beneficial for us all to exist. That's exactly right. You know, it's an irony because like supposedly the more money you spend on war, it actually makes you less secure. Yeah. It makes you less secure. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, so I believe the war is a thing of the past now, but we have to actually drive the stake at the heart that is the dying animal that is NATO. Because yes, even though it's quote unquote dying, as Scott Ritter likes to say, he's definitely right on this, you know, the NATO and Western forces are dying. You know what, a, what an animal does when it starts dying? It starts to act irrational. OK, yeah. it will buck around. It will do as much damage as it can before it decides to kick the bucket. All right. These people are suicidal maniacs. OK, they will launch a nuclear warhead if they thought they were going to lose any kind of power. That's the kind of forces we're up against right now. Yeah, I agree with you. I do think that they are desperate and they've hit the the empires hit the point of desperation of we're losing our grip on the world. Oh, no. What do we do? And the only way we've ever been able to maintain that grip is by bullying by being in everybody's face, being the bigger, the bigger, badder military. And that doesn't work as much anymore because there is a new form that it is, it's old. You're right. It's, it's antiquated. It's what, um, less developed countries maybe go to war with one another now, you know, that's, but so we're not, but we're still doing it. You know, we're still acting like, Oh no, this is the way. And it's just really not the way. So you're anti-war. Um, yes. now let's go to uh, climate change. Where are you on, on with that? Carbon-based climate change is an excuse to make sure that nothing can be developed or made or uh, any progress can be made. My favorite quote on this is Obama. He went to South Africa in 2014. He says, folks, I'm sorry, but you can't have air conditioner. The world's <laughs> going to boil over. The world's going to boil over, folks. We can't have that. Now I'm going to get on my private jet in my air-conditioned jet, 
And, you know, this is, the, this, is a, this is a real thing. In 2014, he goes to South Africa and he tells South Africans they can't have cars or air conditioning because then the world's going to boil over. I mean, <laughs> it's just it's a it's a it's just a new form of imperialism. That's all it is. You know, and it's, well, it's always a new form been of there. like keeping people down. It's like instead of using the military now, they're saying, OK, well, we just can't allow you to economically develop. Right? Yes. So, but just, I have a day in the Stone Ages, Brazil, yeah. stay in the Stone Ages, Russia. Or, 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 you know, countries in Africa, too, you know, yeah, they, right. they do these things like what, like carbon taxes and the World Bank says we'll give you money, but you can only use it to develop inferior forms of energy. You cannot build an economy on windmills and solar panels. It's just right. right? And um, but at the same time, I'm not against the debate. See, here's the thing, right? If you say what I just said. Ah, you're a climate denier. Ah, you know, you're you, no one should listen to you. This guy's clearly insane. No. I think these things should be debated. I think these things should be, you know, you should have town halls, you should have real dissenting opinions, and people should be allowed to form their own goddamn opinion as long as it's truthful and informed. You know, Will Happer over in Princeton is really good on this stuff. Uh, you know, that guy did atmospheric sciences. He invented a lot of the sciences that, that, that people still use today and reference today when it comes to the atmosphere. That guy knows what he's talking about, right? So... I think the problem is, is that you have this censorship going on, not just online, but in academia, too, where you cannot say you can't even question the validity of, well, wait, what if the world does go up two degrees Celsius by year 2099? I mean, is that really as disastrous? How do we know? Right. right. You see, so I, I, I'm just telling people there should be more scientific honesty and inquiry. That is ultimately what matters when it comes to trying to figure out what quote unquote climate change actually is about. Because yeah. the way I would take that question here in the Bronx is if some young kid comes up to me and says, well, what are you going to do about climate change? What are we going to do about the climate change on Mars? That's the thing, right? If we are talking about inhabiting Mars in the next 50 years, how do we actually build an atmosphere on Mars so that people can breathe on there without having to build some kind of dome? Can we actually terraform Mars and have an atmosphere on Mars, right, that is not just sucking in carbon? How do we actually bring an atmosphere to Mars? That's, that's climate change science right there. Hey, guys, be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you like this segment. Now, you might be wondering... This seems like it's part of a bigger show. You're right, it is. The full show is at KimIversonShow.com. So what you're watching is just a clip. And if you want to get the full experience, then you got to go to KimIversonShow.com. The show airs Monday through Friday, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern at KimIversonShow.com. That is where you can watch the full show. Here, you just get clips. So click on the link down below, go to the full show, enjoy. Otherwise, I'll see you next time right here. And be sure once again, like, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching.